Hello and welcome to Unheard. I'm Freddie Sayers. Is the war in Ukraine changing the whole world order? Or perhaps is it revealing that the world order had already changed and now we're suddenly noticing it? Some leaders in the West seem to be insisting that the post-World War II world order must stay standing. We just need to try harder or sanction better or brandish more weapons. Other leaders are grimly aware of a different world that we're coming into and are trying to adapt to it. Just this week, we learned that Boris Johnson wanted to punch Emmanuel Macron's lights out because he was so annoyed how conciliatory Macron was sounding with Russia. Meanwhile, in the US, the contrast between a more maximalist Joe Biden and a more ruthlessly pragmatic Donald Trump is starting to take shape. So the UK, France, America, each of them have different visions of what this new world might look like. They're pulling in different directions and we want to understand them. Gérard Arrault is someone who we hope can help us. He's one of France's top former diplomats. He was ambassador to Israel, then the United Nations, and then to the US during both the Obama and Trump administrations. And since the Ukraine war, he has been unusually outspoken for a diplomat on how we need to wake up to a different world. He joins me from New York to tell us more. Bonjour, Monsieur Avo. Bonjour, good morning. So on the back of your book, which is called Histoire Diplomatique, Lessons from Yesterday for Today's World, it says, I'm quoting, the Western moment is coming to an end and we are seeing the appearance of a world of great powers which have to define a balance based on the balance of power, similar to that which Europe knew until 1914. Let's start there. What do you mean by that? Well, actually, you know, after 1945, the world was dominated by two superpowers, the US and USSR, and they were managing, each of them were managing their camp, and basically their confrontation, uh, their confrontation was at the margin of the two camps. After the collapse of the communist bloc, there was only one superpower, one hyperpower, you know, to quote the French Minister of Foreign Affairs, and it was what I call the Western moment, when basically the West, i.e. the United States, was where dominating uh, uh, this order. And now it's over. It's over not because of the decline of the US or the decline of the West, but because of public balancing. You know, China is back. Uh, don't forget that China was the main power till the 18th century. China is back, India, Russia, and all these countries basically are defending their, their, their own interest in a more balanced way. And the West has to adjust to this new reality. It's like the Game of Thrones world, where there are different powers all competing and there is no hegemon. Is that how you see the exactly. new world? It's, you know, that's the, that's the reason why I was referring in my book to uh, the world before 1914. You know, from the fall of Napoleon in 1815 to 1914, there was what was called the concert of nations. And then we had five or six major powers and trying to keep a balance between them. And the system was preventing major wars. There were wars, but not major wars, to the total collapse of the system in July, August 1914. And in a sense, we are back to this world but the world extending to all the planet. You know, 1914, it was Europe which was dominating the world. Now it's a world, again, uh, uh, really a global world, which has to find, and the, the danger right now is that we are in a transition period. We have to define a new power. And above all, we have to define a new balance between China and the US. The most important bilateral relationship that we have to manage will be between China and the, the United States. I mean, if what's interesting is that this kind of talk, talk of a multipolar world, has been quite heretical and considered quite dangerous until recently. It was almost like something you didn't want to say out loud because it was in some way conceding ground or surrendering Western power. It now feels like everyone's suddenly saying it. We even had Christian Lagarde, who is normally very... Uh, establishment and on message saying that we have a new multipolar world order. Do you think everyone accepts this now or do you think there are still lots of people who are refusing to see it? Well, I think first it's a dangerous world, you're right. 
And uh, and it's a dangerous movement, as I was saying, because it's a transition movement. So people have to adjust to this new reality, and it's not always very easy. Uh, you know, everybody in America is talking about the trap of Thucydides, you know, the, the Greek historian. You know, saying that really the war uh, between Sparta and Athens was a war because Sparta was seeing the ascent of Athens and wanted to stop Athens before it was too late. And some people say that the First World War was the UK really trying to, to stop the ascent of Germany. So now we are again, you have uh, the established power, the United States, and suddenly you have this really ascending power, China. And some people are saying, you know, the United States uh, has some problem to adjust to this new reality. And, uh, you know, really, we could have a war, uh, really, in the same way that we had a war between Sparta and Athens. It's true that the U.S. has some problem to accept the fact that it has to, in a sense, to to share the world power with 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 China. And I think that's the main danger, the main danger in the, com in the coming years, whether the two powers are really able to reach a new modus vivendi, especially in Asia. Because actually there are a lot of voices inside the US who don't accept this. I mean, we've had people on this show saying that American power needs to project even more strongly in this dangerous world and needs to be more assertive on the question of Taiwan. We need to have you know, greater American military bases around the place. And then other people are saying, no, it's time to sort of accept a slight retreat from being the world's policeman. I'm, I'm guessing you fall into the latter camp where you think facing reality is the safer option. Yes, uh, I think that, you know, you have, you know, a, a world, a world order has to be the reflection of uh, the balance of power. And if the balance of power is changing, the world order has to change. And the balance of power has been changing, not because China is a threat, but simply because China, the power of China, you know, has dramatically increased recently. So what the Americans need uh, uh, is a mix of containment and engagement. Uh, containment, we have a lot of it, you know, really, for instance, the agreement called Olocus, you know, really... Uh, between the UK, Australia, and the US. If the Australians want nuclear submarines, you know, it's obviously against China. Uh, we have also the fact that the Americans now are sending back their ships to the Philippines. Uh, they had left 30 years ago. And, and also, you know, uh, the fact that Japan is increasing its military budget and so on and so on. So you have in Asia, obviously, some containment. And I think containment is necessary, but we need... Uh, a political engagement so that both sides know the headlines of of the other of of the other side. And unfortunately, we have seen recently really a rise of tensions. And to be frank, the Chinese are not the only responsible of that. As you know, in the U.S., and I'm not the first one to say it. You know, Fahri Zakaria said it on CNN, and the the correspondent of the Financial Times, Ed Liu, said it. There is an anti-Chinese hysteria in the U.S. Uh, which makes very difficult for any American president to really genuinely engage with the, with the Chinese. It's funny that you have to quote CNN to sort of make it okay to say that. But so this anti-Chinese hysteria, do you think that it is going to lead to war? I mean, that's the question, isn't it? What's your analysis? Do you, can it be stopped or do you think it now has a momentum of its own? You know, there is always, uh, for um, I think diplomats, there is always the fear of what I would call the Sarajevo moment. You know, an obscure uh, uh, Austrian prince is assassinated in an obscure city in June 1914, and suddenly you have a world war that nobody wanted, actually. Uh, so we could also imagine, you know, an incident in the uh, South China Sea between two ships, a Chinese and an American. You know, they are playing right now. They are very close to each other. They are patrolling very close to each other. No, I think that maybe the hope we have to avoid such a brutal and escalation is the fact that you have two nuclear powers, China and the U.S., and, and they know that if they really if they start uh, a military escalation it will go it will go very 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 far and in a very dangerous manner so i had hope that nuclear deterrence 
would have prevented us from falling into the Sarajevo trap. Yeah, I mean, although Russia and NATO are nuclear powers and didn't seem to prevent hostilities starting in that theater. Before, before we come on to the Ukraine, I guess I need to say on the China question, if China acts against Taiwan, so more than just some scuffle with two boats, if they start a blockade or actually an invasion or something like that, do you think America would actually defend Taiwan militarily and go to war? Uh, I think they will. I, I guess they will do it. Yes. I, I'm not sure that they must do it, but I, I think then we'll, uh, they will do it. Do you think that's going to happen? We, we, we've had people on this show saying they think it might happen soon, even before 2027. The, there was something the President Xi said about preparing his military in time for 2027 that's got a lot of commentators excited. Do you, do you think it will happen? Again, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but a war uh, on Taiwan would mean the collapse of the world economy. And, and China will be the first victim of the collapse of the world economy, considering that China is the factory of the world. People forget that China has hundreds of millions of people living in abject poverty. People forget the vulnerability of Chinese demography. So I really, again, country, you can, t you can even the answer that actually Putin uh, took an irrational decision according to our rationality, so why not Xi Jinping? Uh, but uh, so it's a it's a bet, and I may be wrong. But if there is no change of the status quo, uh, really, uh, I don't see why the Chinese would attack Taiwan uh, in the in the coming future. Let's move to the issue of Ukraine, if we could, because this is one that is seems to be affecting your country and our country here in the UK slightly differently, or there are different emphases between the two governments, and of course. The U.S., where you've been living for a long time, has, a, has another emphasis. Do you think that Emmanuel Macron's government in France is more keen to find a sort of peaceful solution to the war in Ukraine than the British government is? I wouldn't agree with your characterization of the Biden administration, because I think we have, uh, we have had, since the beginning of the war, two camps. Uh, two Western camps. On one side, you have the Eastern European countries supported by the UK, uh, which believe that only a decisive victory of Ukraine uh, could be uh, the uh, reasonable outcome and uh, outcome of the war. On the other side, I think you have, and I say that France and the US and Germany and some other countries, in a sense, are close uh, or are closer uh, by, and they Basically, what I do think is that a decisive victory is impossible. Uh, that the scenario, the most likely scenario now is a long war. And that a long war is a very, very negative uh, uh, outcome for Ukraine, which is devastated. You know, Ukraine is, people forget, is a very poor country. Uh, you know, it's the third, it's GDP per capita is the third of Bulgaria, which is the poorest country, EU country. And for, it has already lost 35% of its GDP. So it will be devastating. There will be a long war. And on the top of that, we are not sure that actually the U.S. Uh, uh, support uh, really with the elections in 2024, what will be the U.S. support in the coming years? What will be the, the support of the European public opinion? You know, really, uh, especially during the, the, the winter 23, 24. So I suppose that the difference between both sides, again, it's caricaturing and you, there are nuances, of course, on both sides, is that on one side is decisive victory at all costs. On the other side is decisive victory is not possible. So let's try to find a, a, diplomatic, a, a diplomatic issue. And not right now, because really they want to fight, but I think after the, the Ukrainian offensive. So I think that would be uh, the, 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 the difference between the two camps. But uh, last point, uh, so far they have been able really to overcome their, 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 their differences and to take united decisions, which is by far the most important. That's interesting. So you see the US and France and to an extent Germany sort of leading a more realistic uh, uh, school in terms of Ukraine. And the, the UK is actually more aligned with Eastern European countries who are right on the border of Russia, like Poland, like Lithuania, etc., who are, are much more frightened and therefore want kind of maximal repulsion of the Russians at all costs. 
I think, you know, really, again, going back to the U.S., because in a sense, of course, it's the most important actor in, in, this, in this tragedy. For the U.S., basically, this war is a distraction. And for them, uh, what matters is China, China, China. And uh, so they have been, in a sense, dragged into the conflict by the Russian aggression. But they want to get it as soon, uh, out of it as soon as possible. Not at any, uh, of course, at any uh, condition, but they want to get it as soon as possible. You know, you have the, the, the U.S. chief of defense, uh, General Milley, who twice said publicly it's very unlikely that Ukrainians will recover all the occupied territories. And you had very, also, I think last week, you had an article in Foreign Affairs by two luminaries of the uh, Foreign Affairs establishment, U.S. Foreign Affairs establishment, Richard Haas and Charles Kupchan, coming from the Bush administration and the Obama administration, and basically saying, you know, we should really find a way to launch a negotiation. Uh, and they even said, and if necessary, we should twist the arm of the Ukrainians. And coming from these guys, frankly, I think it was quite significant. Significant. There's a sort of unspoken reality then, at least in the US establishment and French, that fully expelling the Russians back to pre-2014 borders is not going to happen. And so there's going to have to be a deal at some point. Let me just ask you about the British, because in this country, if you say anything along these lines, that maybe we need to think about a negotiated settlement, maybe it's not realistic that Crimea is going to come back and be part of Ukraine, etc., you're very quickly accused of being a pro-Putin apologist or propagandist or taking lines from the Kremlin, these kinds of things. The atmosphere is very fraught and a lot of people feel very passionately that unless he is completely defeated, he will in some way have gained from his aggression. He'll be rewarding aggression and that sets a terrible precedent. Tell me why those people are wrong. No, first, I think the atmospherics that you are describing in the UK, I think that are the atmospherics in Europe and even in France, you know, really basically, uh, in a sense, Macron is an isolated voice in his own country. So on the TV shows, you know, when myself, you know, usually I'm immediately accused of being pro-Putin because I think that really uh, at some moment we need to, to, to negotiate. So we have really the, the we have this the same uh, the same atmospherics. The problem again is uh, whether we are going to fight to the last Ukrainian. And uh, uh, basically uh, the analysis and the analysis of the U.S. military Again, I open a parenthesis. In the U.S., the atmospherics are very different from the European atmospherics. There is much less passion, uh, much less emotion than we have on our continent for an obvious reason, geography, uh, geography, uh, geography matters. So the question is, really, even if the Ukrainians, uh, uh, hopefully, actually, are able you know, to, to, re to, re to retake Crimea and Donbass, but the war won't be over. Because the, the Russians will go on, and we, so again, uh, the the not really there is no credible scenario where the Ukrainians may finish this war uh, by a decisive victory with the Russians surrendering, uh, and so so the danger, as I have said, is a very long war, a sort of uh, uh, abscess on the flanks of 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 Europe, uh, and. Uh, with all the dangers, the political dangers, including the, on the American side. You know, because you are referring to Trump, uh, who could be elected in 2024, but there is also a fatigue in the American public opinion. A lot of Americans I've met are telling me, well, that's an European war. Why are we spending so much war on, 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 on defending Europe? You know, really, so even if, uh, if hopefully uh, Biden is re-elected, uh, I don't see really the U.S. pouring a, another 50 billion euro dollars on the defense of, of Ukraine. And again, on the European side, it will be difficult uh, to, uh, to really to take the role and the, the, to support Ukraine the way the Americans are doing it. And let me ask you about Trump and Biden then. I mean, you've, you were ambassador in Washington for most of Trump's presidency and, and a big chunk of Obama's second term. What Trump said on his CNN town hall last week in the response to the Ukraine question is, give me 24 hours and I'll settle it. I'll do a deal. That's just 
talk, obviously, um, that was reacted to with horror. And I read in some British papers that Trump was threatening, this is a quote, threatening to impose peace on Ukraine. And I'm wondering if he did such a deal, if any president did such a deal, would that be a bad thing or would that be a good thing? No, I think that really, um, solving such a war in 24 hours uh, could be done only by surrendering to the, to the Russian demands. And we know that Trump, you know, really for some reason, obscure reasons, hates Zelensky and Ukraine. And, and we know that the guy is vindictive and is not, is acting on his own feeling, you know, really from his guts and from his guts, it's really, is really, uh, uh, ready to throw overboard Ukraine, you know, really. So I, I think it would be, a, it would be a, dis, a, a real disaster. And, uh, and I think that the Russians are betting on that. And, uh, so, the, so, uh, you know, if you, if you would ask me, do you think that really a negotiation is possible? I think we should try, it, but I think it, it really, it's very unlikely that it will succeed because the interest of the Russians is obviously to wait for the American elections and also to bet on the fatigue of the European public, public, uh, public opinion, uh, unfortunately. But you think, from what you've been saying, that even if Biden is re-elected or a Democrat is re-elected, because you know, who knows who will be around at that point, he'll make a deal anyway. No, if Biden is elected, you know, it, there will be, I think, a pressure on, 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 the, on him, a pressure to put an end to this war. Uh, as I have said, for them, it's a secondary strategic interest. Uh, they have other concerns. You know, you have a lot of uh, really strategists, uh, not only the Republican strategy, say we should shift to, to China. That's our ma uh, major, major interest. And, uh, you know, I think there was a, in a hearing in the Senate, uh, really, usually it's it was off the record, but in, in, in Washington, nothing is off the record. Uh, Blinken, the Secretary of State, of State, told the senators that he found that a territorial compromise uh, could be the outcome of this war. So I think that the Americans are ready to give up Crimea. You know, and if you look at their declarations, they have never taken the commitment of really bringing back Crimea uh, to, 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 to Ukraine. So they are ready to negotiate. Uh, again, the problem is whether the Russians are ready to negotiate or whether they want a total, uh, a total victory. Just to be clear, though, do you think the difference between a Biden deal and a Trump deal is that a Biden deal is going to be better for Ukraine in some ways? So Trump is what you think it might end up surrendering all of the eastern provinces or something like that, but then a Biden deal would be everything except Crimea? Is, it, is that the sort of lines that you would expect? The problem of Trump, uh, the Trump is that he's so incoherent, so inconsistent, that it's even difficult to understand what he, he will accept. You remember that he met twice with Kim Jong-un, you know, the North Korean leader. And I thought it was a good idea, but basically he went there and he had nothing in his pocket and there was a vague declaration and nothing came out, out of it. So the danger would be that Trump goes and meets... But you say nothing came out of it. There weren't so many tests after that. As I recall, something came out of it, which was that North Korea wasn't so much of a problem after that. You could say that was a successful, strange as it may have been, it was a successful piece of diplomacy. Yes, but I again, I, I, I thought that it was a good idea that the president of the U.S. would take him personally the, the issue, uh, but there was nothing really substantial, no agreement between between both sides. And what the North Koreans did afterwards, you you can say, well, it's because they met uh, they met Trump, uh, and as you know now, North Korea is more threatening than than ever. So I suppose that you can say that the issue has not absolutely not been settled. Uh, you know, I I understand what you you imply because I actually I share this point of view that the criticism of Trump. Uh, by the Washington bubble, you know, the think tankers and so on, was really basically extreme that uh, but, uh, Trump had good intuitions. You know, when Trump says, why to defend Montenegro? Because Montenegro is a member of NATO. 
from an American point of view, it's a very good question. You know, why the Americans would defend Montenegro? You know, really, and it's the Americans who actually brought Montenegro into NATO against the will of the French and the Germans. Uh, but the problem is that he has these intuitions, but he doesn't build on that. You know, he doesn't know what is a bureaucracy, he doesn't know what is diplomatic engineering, and in a sense, that's the danger. It doesn't go beyond uh, declara declarations. And try to imagine with, with Ukraine, as he is against NATO, it would mean also, I suppose, that he would oppose uh, Ukraine joining NATO. He may actually threaten the very existence of NATO because he, is, he will be totally unhinged. Although it is notable that the invasion didn't take place during Trump's presidency. I mean, do you think it's fair to speculate, you know, would, if Trump had won a second term, do you think Putin would have rolled the tanks over the border? Correlation doesn't mean causation. So really it's really it. No, of course, I, I, really, uh, I, I really don't know. Uh, you, you may have a point, you know, really, because when with, with Trump, you can't forecast anything. You, you can't guess what he will do uh, the day after. Uh, including his national security advisor. You know, I remember when he went out of the uh, the Iran deal, uh, his national security advisor didn't know the day before uh, he, he did it, that he was going to do it. So he's totally unpredictable. Uh, and uh, so maybe that would it's be It's the kind of crazy man theory or whatever they say that, you know, maybe if they don't know what he's going to do, they don't dare to take do big moves like Putin just took. I mean, there's a certain sense to it, isn't there? So I'm now going to get in trouble of sounding like I'm uh, defending Donald Trump, but foreign policy-wise, it is fair to say that there were fewer wars during his presidency than before or since. Really? No, no. I, I know this crazy guy. Uh, theory, I wrote a book about Kissinger, a biography of Kissinger, so I, um, I remember that Nixon was very uh, was very keen on on, on that. But as you really, everybody has its own limitations. I am a diplomat, so I really, for me, the idea of, a, of craziness in foreign policy uh, is very is very dangerous because it means that everything is everything is is, is possible. And uh, but I agree with you uh, with nuances on the fact that uh, the foreign policy of Trump was not that bad. That as I have said. He was getting out of this bubble of in Washington, which is so pro-interventionist, uh, which led, after all, to the major disaster of the invasion of Iraq in, 2000, in 2003. And it's in this bubble that people are obviously counter-just to the new reality that the U.S. is not the world hegemon anymore, and that they have we have to define a balance and that even authoritarian regime uh, have legitimate security interests, which is very difficult to hear uh, in, in Washington, and I should say in, in a lot of European capitals. I guess the, the deep question here is that if you're right, and I suspect you are, that we are moving into this more multipolar world or world of power balance rather than a single world order, then what does good diplomacy look like in that new world? Or what does what does each power block want to project? Because for the previous few decades, people in your line of work have been all about international regulations, treaties, supranational organizations that can enforce this world order and the rest of it. But if we now have three or four or five power blocks who don't really care about each other's rules, I guess you have to project strength more than ever. Do you think that's true? Do you think your you and your diplomat friends need to sort of rethink the way they do diplomacy. No, the first the problem is that what you what you or what we were so what people called the the world order was actually a Western world order it was seen as dominated by the West. Other countries, non-Western countries, were seeing in our policies uh, hypocrisy, double standards, uh, really. Uh, and again, I was referring to the invasion of, of, of Iraq. You can refer also to the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflicts. And, and uh, the scores of military interventions by the U.S., uh, really, that we, 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 we forget. So first, it was a Western order. Now, as I have said, when the balance of power is changing, the order has to change. 
which means that we have to take care of the interest of other countries. Uh, we have to accept that India, you know, has a strong national interest to import cheap Russian gas and not to see it as a sort of an aggression. You know, if we were India, actually, we would do the same. So it means that we have uh, to find, you know, really to 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 world, you know, to to live in a world which is more fluid, much more fluid. We have to have partial agreements on some issues uh, with some countries while accepting these agreements on other issues. And uh, we have also to accept the idea that sovereignty, the, the, the sovereignty is, uh, in a sense, the, 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 the top of the, the concerns of all these countries. And they, are, they accuse us very often to try to infringe on their uh, sovereignty, or for instance, on behalf of uh, uh, human rights. You know, one day I was at the United Nations, I gave a very moving speech about human rights in Cuba. And at the end of the speech, the, the ambassador of Cuba who was a good friend of mine, a French speaker, came to me and said, Gerard, I loved your speech, and next time you make the same speech about Saudi Arabia, please call me. And of course, I was not going to make a speech about human rights in Saudi Arabia. So that's the way they see us, us, the West. They don't like us. They consider that we have abuse. We have abuse of our power. We were former colonial powers. So to have to, we have to accept uh, this uh, this new reality. Uh, we have to uh, learn restraint and modesty uh, in our foreign policy. Do you think the overreach of the West in the last twelve months, even or sixteen months since the invasion of Ukraine, has made that worse? Because it sure feels like the limitations of Western power have been exposed. This unprecedented level of sanctions, literally taking money and confiscating it, banning companies. It was no, no one's ever tried to isolate a country quite as much as we did with Russia in the last 12 months. It doesn't appear to have worked as well as it was supposed to. Uh, and suddenly, as you say, India trading oil, South America, obviously Iran, South Africa, all these countries who you might think we have good relations with some of them are not playing ball. Yes. The West seems a lot smaller than it did just two years ago. Do you think that's true? You know, that, there, are two, there are two points in what you said. First, I think you're right. Uh, you, you know, this war has revealed uh, the uh, underlying reality of, as I was saying, the rebalancing of the world powers at the expense of the West. And especially at the expense of Europe, you know, really, I, I do believe that the United States, for a lot of different reasons, will remain the main power for the coming decades. But it's obvious that Europe, uh, because of its demography and uh, because of other problems, you know, really has, has been weakened and has, has shown its, its, its relative uh, weakness since it has not been able to defend its own territory without the support and the leadership of, of the U.S. So that's, that's, a reality, that's the new reality, and now it's conspicuous, a conspicuous reality. The second point, and I'm not going to enter into it because it's very technical, is the problem of sanctions. You know, when I was ambassador to the U.N., it was nearly a joke because when we didn't know what to do, we were sanctioning. So there are scores of regimes of sanctions. Sanctions have become a sort of uh, uh, really by default, a policy by default. You don't want really to fight, but you, you have to show that you are doing something, so you are sanctioning. Uh, so I think that after this war, we should have really, frankly, uh, an analysis of what, what is the use, the effectiveness of, of sanctions. My question, though, is did we make it worse? I mean, did those let's call them idealists, if they are in the different camp to realists, such as Boris Johnson. Actually, we've had three prime ministers since the invasion, Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, and Rishi Sunak, all of them embracing Volodymyr Zelensky in their very first day in office, all of them talking about Ukraine, sometimes before they talked about the UK in their speech in front of number 10. Did all of that, do you think, make the situation worse in that it kind of exposed Western weakness sooner? No, I don't think so. I think uh, I think it was very uh, very important to immediately to react to the aggression of Russia. And I, I would go a bit further, saying the mistake is that we didn't do it before the invasion of 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 Ukraine. 
I think that it was right to to try to negotiate uh, with uh, with Putin. It was right to go to uh, to Moscow. But I think that our my president and, and the other Western leaders uh, should have told uh, Putin, if you invade uh, uh, Ukraine, we will be with Ukraine. We'll support Ukraine with all our our strength. So no, I think that the the UK the UK reaction uh, was very helpful. Uh, really, uh, it was necessary to save Ukraine because you know people believed that Ukraine was going to fall in a few in a few days. So, how about the latest idea, which is sending F-16s and fighter jets? The UK has just signed up to this plan after lobbying from the Ukrainian government. By the sounds of things, France is not so keen. The US has, at least for now, ruled it out. What's your view on that? In a sense, I'm, you know, I think it's uh, in a very diplomatic way. I think both sides are right. Uh, I, I don't. You're not a diplomat anymore, Mister. Or you, you, you can speak freely here. We're we're a free speech no, but, channel. But, uh, again, I think you know there is. I don't really understand this concern about escalation, possible escalation by sending some weaponry. Uh, you know, again, lo- lo- look at at the U.S. U.S. has opposed the delivery of planes. Uh, to uh, to Ukraine and has been very you know when he saw the approach has been piecemeal you know weaponry after weaponry uh, but I don't see which escalation we we should fear you know the Russians have been bombing and bombing everything without any restraint so I think that sending weapons and any type of weapons to the Ukrainians I think should be our policy but on the other side and uh, that's my uh, the other side is. Again, I, I and I've talked with a lot of military, American and French military. I don't see how the Ukrainians could win a decisive victory. And I really do think that a long war is a disastrous scenario in human and political terms. So I do think that we should, at some moment, we should think of a negotiation, maybe a ceasefire, an armistice, which of course won't fulfill all the goal, the legitimate goals of the Ukrainians. But would put an end to this uh, to this uh, slow turn. So on the, May the tenth, you tweeted the F sixteen was so much designed to defend freedom in quotes that it was sold to Bahrain, Egypt, the UAE, Oman, Jordan, etc. What did you mean by that? No, it was really to answer to a to a Lithuanian minister. Really, uh, I think that's some the. Polish and the, the, some leaders of Poland and the Baltic states are a bit overbo- are going overboard, you know, really. And this guy said simply, uh, the FCG has been built to be the, 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 the weapon of, of freedom. And so they, they should be sent uh, to Ukraine. So I was making some sarcastic French answer to that, saying that the F-16 has never been designed to be the weapon of freedom. It has been designed to be a weapon. But you do think they should be sent to Ukraine? I think yes. I think the weapon. You know, when he planes, I, I, yes, they should be. Uh, they, they should be sent to Ukraine. And most of, most of the systems of weaponry, uh, considering uh, the way the Russians are, are are behaving. And again, there is. I understand the risk of escalation. Any diplomat is always terrified by by the risk of escalation. But again, having seen what the Russians have done so far, I don't see. Where they could go further, uh, but the use of nuclear weapons and that I I don't believe the Russians would go to that at least till uh, the Ukrainians reach Crimea. But if they want to go beyond the Crimean border, you think nuclear becomes more likely? I think it's 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 hypothetical, but uh, I suppose. But again, that's my personal analysis that Crimea is a different issue even different from Donbass. Uh, and uh, so if the Ukrainians reach Crimea, I think that there will be first a debate in the West, because I don't, I'm not sure that everybody, and especially the United States, but also France and Germany, would support Ukraine to go and uh, attack Crimea. And I expect, I may be wrong, but I expect the Russians, uh, again, to use again uh, the threat uh, the, the the threat of nuclear nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, nuclear weapons are are supposed to be used for uh, the vital interest of 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 the country, and uh, 
hypothetically, you may consider that the Russians who declare that Crimea is a vital, is their vital interest, considering Russian history, considering the 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 personal role of uh, of uh, Putin, also considering the Black Sea, the access to the Black Sea. The trouble is, though, if you give them your F-16s and your long-range missiles, and they have a breakthrough, and they're racing towards the Crimean border, the Ukrainian forces are not going to stop, are they? Does anyone think that? A sort of phone call from Paris or even Washington saying, oh, hold up, guys, no further than the Crimean border, just doesn't feel like a real-world scenario. So you hand over the weapons, and then it's no longer in the power of the West to decide when the Ukrainians stop. I, I Again, I... I'm not sure that Ukraine will confront the United States if the United States is very, uh, I think, forceful on this issue. And and again, it's also, as I've said, there is, it's hypothetically, if there is a real threat by, by a nuclear threat by, by, by Russia. But I understand what you, what you mean. Of course, everything is, is uh, very hypothetical. Uh, and and usually, you know, really well, the spokesperson in any foreign ministry is answering. I don't answer hypothetical questions. Uh, uh, so uh, how it will happen? What will be the condition? Maybe if there is a Russian collapse, if the Russians are suddenly collapsing, you know, really we won't have time to argue, and Ukrainians will be already been in uh, uh, in Crimea, you know, really. So that that's you 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 have different scenarios. Let me finish, if I may, by asking you about Europe, because this is something you've been very vocal on. Obviously, that's your country, uh, France, right in the middle of Europe. Do you think that Europe needs to try to become its own proper power, in other words, that if it can no longer rely on Uncle Sam, on the America being the global policeman, do you think that Europe needs to build up a massive army, massive defense forces, and sort of prepare to defend itself? No, France has been a Cassandra in Europe for, for the last decades. Uh, we have been advocating European defense and, to, to be frank, to no avail. The result is a bit pathetic. You know, the European Union has some military capability, but they are very, they are very limited. Uh, because, in a sense, everybody is answering, we have NATO and under American leadership, the Americans are doing the job. And the Americans in Ukraine are really doing the job. So, and you have a threat now, uh, which is Russia. So it means that strategic autonomy of Europe or European defense, uh, it's less than ever uh, on, uh, 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 on the agenda. Uh, the moment is an Atlantist, is an, uh, a moment of Atlantic solidarity, Euro-Atlantic solidarity under the, the aegis of, of the US and, and NATO. So that's, that's where we are today. And I suspect that as long as the the European the U.S. commitment will remain credible, uh, the European countries are going to answer to the French. No, thank you. We don't want any European defense decoupled from 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 the U.S. So everything will depend on the result of the elections in November 2024. But for the moment, uh, the French will remain the the voice in the desert. Well, the the Germans have sort of changed their tune quite dramatically, haven't they? It's only the tune, you know, because they have announced they're going to spend 100 billion euros, uh, but they have not yet spent one euro. Uh, so let's look, at, let's look at it, you know. It's obvious, forgetting this issue about NATO, EU, Europe, the US, it's obvious that for most of European countries, it means that they have to increase their defense budgets. Actually, France, as you may know, has announced that he's going to do it by 30% in the coming five, uh, the coming five years. Uh, the, the dividends of peace are over. Uh, we have to, to, to rearm, uh, obviously. So you think in our lifetimes, there will be German munitions factories once again. You know, the Volkswagen and Mercedes factories will be repurposed towards building tanks or drones and you know, there'll be factories in France producing weapons. Do you think that is going to happen? Oh, yes. I think you get, again, the, the German question is an interesting question because first, the German question uh, has been interesting for one, more than one century, especially for the French. But uh, all jokes apart, 
Uh, the, f the, the question mark is whether Germany wants to be a power again. Uh, there is a real, it's a real existential question. And, and the, the, so far, the Germans have answered by uh, a resounding no. They don't want to enter into power politics. They don't have the foreign policy of their power. And, and the question mark is whether what is happening in Ukraine is going to change that. And so far, beyond words, obviously, the Germans are very uncomfortable with this, uh, with this idea. Uh, so, so that, I think, it's the, the central question in, in Europe is whether the Germans, Germany is going to move back to a power, to a power, a power politics. Uh, because in European Union now, since the UK has unfortunately left, uh, it really there is only France, which is ready to play this game, and France doesn't have the means uh, really to play. The, it has the means to play a game, but it can't be uh, a, a leader. The leader of Europe, the other European countries don't want it, and anyway, France doesn't have the clout uh, to do it. So we need to have the Germans with us, but the question mark is whether the Germans want it. Final word is on this country then. You said it's a shame we've left Europe. We've left the European Union, haven't left Europe. And some might say that the UK has been quite a leader on this Ukrainian question, certainly swifter than some of its European colleagues. Maybe the UK is the uh, defence leader in Europe that you're looking for. No, first, I think it has nothing to do with being in the EU or not in the EU. You could have the same policy in the EU uh, than uh, out, out of the EU. Uh, secondly, as you know, the military, the British military is more or less uh, equal to the French military. And so you are our natural uh, uh, partners. Uh, we had a special defense treaty, the Lancaster House Treaty, and, and actually we loved to work together. Uh, so now, now the question mark is whether you out of the EU us in the EU, we can still work together because we are the natural, in a sense, the natural defense leaders uh, in Europe, considering uh, the position of, of, of Germany. So I do hope that when we are going beyond these unavoidable squabbles about Brexit, the way Brexit is done or is not done, I hope that wisdom, the wisdom will, will be back in Paris and in London and that we, we will work together. Monsieur Gérard Arrault, thank you so much for your time today. It's always, it was a pleasure. Thank you. That was Gérard Arrault, one of France's most senior diplomats, ambassador to Washington all the way until 2019. I was tempting him there to be a little bit less diplomatic, which occasionally, I think, happened. But what we definitely saw clearly is that in his view, the Ukraine war has revealed an ideological divide. There are two camps. There are the realists, let's call them, including France and Germany, and as he was saying, even the US under President Biden. And in the other camp, there are the idealists headed by the UK and including Eastern European countries like Poland, and of course, Vladimir Zelensky himself. It's so important to realize that whatever the atmosphere might be on social media, here or wherever you are, there are serious, sensible voices around the world calling for a bit more moderation bit more caution and compromise. And it most certainly does not make you a Putin puppet to pay those voices some attention. Thanks for tuning in. This was Unheard.